So recording starting now. Uh, so the title for today is Combinations. So it, we're still on unit two, and this is actually our last, our last lesson. And then after this, uh, we're going to start with uh, the third unit. It's all going to go by, like I said, because of the structure of the course, it's going to go really, really fast. I apologize for that. I feel like we're cramming a lot in. Um, but this, I would say this, this one, and maybe a little bit of unit three are one of the tougher ones. And then I think after that, in my opinion, it gets a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, so it kind of lightens up a little bit. Okay. So combinations. So don't worry about writing this. I'm just going to go over what we're talking about today. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to simplify expressions that have combinations. And then uh, we're going to talk about how to use this to count. So essentially what you're doing with permutations and combinations is you're learning how to count faster. Okay. Uh, so instead of doing a tree diagram, so we talked about the tree diagram or listing off all the options, those are great methods, um, but that really only works if you only have a small number of things. If you have more, th if you have more objects to count, it's going to take you way too long. And the last thing that we're going to talk about really briefly is just how to know whether you use permutations or combinations. Okay. So quick little recap. Don't worry about writing this down because you actually wrote it down yesterday. Um, this is a note, anyways. Uh, so what we learned yesterday is that if you are arranging n objects, so if I want to put five people in order, there are five factorial ways of doing that. If there's 10 people, there are 10 factorial ways of arranging them in order. Um, and then we learned that if you are, if you have n objects, so I want to say n, I'm just, it just means some unknown number. If I have 10 objects and I want to arrange only five of them in order, then I'm going to be using this formula here, which basically says I take the total number of objects I have, divided by the difference between the number of objects I have and the number of objects I want to arrange. Does that kind of make sense? That's essentially what this is saying right here. Uh, again, this is just a formula from yesterday, so you don't have to type it up because, or, or write it down because it is actually already a note there. Um, so this is just a quick recap of what we did yesterday. So what we're focusing on today is the last case. So we yesterday we talked all about um, and the fact that we're arranged, we pick objects and then we're putting them in a specific order. What if you actually don't care about the order? There's actually a lot of times where you're not going to be worried about the order. So for example, when you're playing card games, um, let's say you're, you have a hand with five cards. You don't actually care the order that you get the five cards, right? You just want the five cards. It doesn't matter which card you get. Uh, so it doesn't matter the order that you get them in, right? So in this case, um, and, and that's a very specific example where you would not actually care about the order. So we would actually would just be interested in the groups that you can create. Or if I'm, for example, uh, picking people for a team, let's say I'm making a team um, at the school. If I'm trying to pick the, the people to be on the team, and normally on any sort of team, you're not gonna have, unless you have specific MVP players or things like that, you normally just wanna get people in the team, right? You're not gonna necessarily assign them a role right away. Uh, in that case, the order doesn't actually matter. You just want to pick the people from the group, right? Um, so there's going to be lots of cases where you're just interested in making groups. You don't actually have to put them in a specific order. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to talk about today is how many ways can we create groups if we're given a certain number of objects. So uh, we did an example yesterday um, that was about five friends going to a movie theater. Do you guys do you remember doing that yesterday? So that was one of the examples in the PowerPoint. And I asked you, how many ways can I put them in seats? Um, so yesterday, again, I think the video got uploaded a little bit late, so you might not have gone over this. But we kind of learned that there was a strategy to do this kind of question. When you're trying to seat five different people down, and you're trying to think of how many ways you can seat them, you basically go through each scenario. You say, OK, in the first seat, how many people can sit there? In the second seat, how many people can sit there? And so on. And keep going, and then you're going to count the total number of options you have. So we're going to do this question again, but there's one change here. It says there are five friends, but now there's actually only three tickets available. So a little change here, only three tickets. So these two last seats are not available. And it says there that in this case, you don't actually care. It's not specifying that we're trying to figure out how many ways we can seat them next to each other. So we don't actually care the order that they're going in. We just want to make sure we give the tickets away. So if you're giving the tickets away to someone, it doesn't really matter if I get the tickets in order like Ashley, Matt, and then Rachel, or Rachel, then Matt, Ashley. 
doesn't matter, right? As long as I get the tickets to some to the three of them, then that counts as one group, right? We're not interested in the order we do it in. So what I want to do first is kind of what we did yesterday. Let's think about who can be in each spot, right? So if uh, the first spot here, if I'm giving the ticket away, so we kind of did something similar to this yesterday. How many people, if we're trying to seat them down, let's go, let's go back to this, uh, the sitting question. We're trying to seat them down. How many people can go in this spot here? There's five friends, so there are five options, right? Okay, so once they got that seat or once they got that ticket, I guess we can think about the tickets. Who can go, who can take the next one? Once you pick that person. Yeah, four. And then the last one would be three. Exactly, right? So that's what we learned yesterday is that you kind of, uh, you that's essentially where the factorial is coming from, right? You're multiplying all the numbers starting with the, the all the total number of people that are in that group and you're going you're multiplying by one number down after that right so you multiply by all the numbers lower than that but in this case we stop at three because again there's only three tickets available um, i think the example we did yesterday had five friends and five seats so it was five times four times three times two times one so this is kind of continuing on the idea from yesterday so everything seems pretty similar to yesterday um, and we know that we're, we can find the total number of ways that we can arrange them by multiplying them together. So five times four times three gives you, so 60, okay with that, All right? So we have 20 times three, um, and we end up getting a total number of ways of 60, so 60 ways to do this. Now there's one little change here. So I'm gonna put right here that this isn't actually correct for this question, but it's, we're getting close to the answer. So there are tech that there, it is true. There are 60 ways that you could put them in order. So in the question yesterday, when we were talking about permutations, there are 60 ways that you can rearrange those three friends that get chosen. But in this case, does the order actually matter once I pick who gets to go? So again, if I make that, if I, if I decide to give the tickets to Matt, Ashley, and Rachel, does it matter if I give the ticket first to Rachel and then Ashley and then Matt? Nah. Or does, no, it doesn't matter. I just have to get the tickets, right? So because it doesn't matter, then the arrangement of the, th of the three people here, I can almost eliminate it altogether. So what I'm actually going to do to find the number of ways to do it, I'm going to take my answer that I had over here, which was 60, but then I have to consider to my, I have to think to myself, all right, but there's actually three factorial ways that I can move them around, right? So if I want to if I want to rearrange these guys, the three people here, there's three factorial ways to do that. I don't want to actually consider that anymore. So to get rid of that option, I divide by three factorial. So the idea there is to divide by the number of people that you actually end up picking, because you are going to have you're you're going to have much less options, right? Because now that you know that order doesn't matter, you don't have to consider all the different possibilities in which the people that you choose can rotate around. Does that kind of make sense? A little bit? So I know I, I know yesterday, um, the permutation stuff, when we start, first started talking about this, this was a little bit difficult. Um, this is basically just a little bit of an extension of it. The only difference with combinations when we're thinking about creating groups is that we don't actually care about the order in which we arrange the people once we created a group. We don't actually care about that. So what we need to do to make up for it is say, you know what, divide by the number of ways you can rotate them because we don't have to consider all the different rotations. There's, so there's six different ways I can rotate the three people here, right? Three times two times one, but we don't actually have to think about six different ways each time. So we can, we basically eliminate one, six, like we eliminate a huge chunk of our options, right? So we only have one six of our options from before. Does that make sense? Okay, so I know it's kind of a lot there, um, so this is the part I definitely need to write, it's kind of what the rule is. So what did we kind of notice? So in the last example, what you kind of notice is that it's kind of like a permutation. We, we basically looked at how many ways we, it's in a sense that it started off the same way, right? We were looking at how many ways we can arrange the people that we have there, the three people that we pick. Uh, but then there's one big difference is that we don't actually have to worry about how the people who are chosen rotate around. Once we picked out who's 
actually going to the movie theater, we don't have to worry about the rotations within that group. So in this last example, once we put the three people in their seats, we didn't have to worry about like those three people and saying like, how, how can I rearrange those three people? I don't have to rearrange those three people because the order doesn't matter. And this is the most important thing. Combinations, what we're gonna learn about today, are cases where the order does not matter at all, right? So once you pick the group, you're done, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to think about how that group is gonna rotate. They're just done as they are, right? You just pick them up. So essentially what we kind of notice is that in this question, the order, if you're just picking out a group, you don't care about the order, you follow the same step as the permutation. It almost looks the same, but then the one little twist is at the end, you have to divide by the number of ways that you can rotate the group that you have because we don't actually care about rotating them that many times, right? We don't care about all the arrangements once you pick the group up. Everyone okay with that so far? So in the last example, just so everyone has it written down, what we really did to find the total number of ways, the number of ways that we can create the group, we took 5 times 4 times 3, right? And that just comes from what we did yesterday. It's not that different. And the only difference here is that we divide by uh, 3 factorial. So we take 5 times 4 times 3 and divide by 3 factorial. So I have a question here. I'm not sure if anyone will have it here. Hopefully, just try your best with this. Is there a way for me to rewrite 5 times 4 times 3 as a permutation? Or is it like using factorials? So it's almost like a factorial, but it's kind of cut off. Yeah, Joe? It's the... Uh... It's like the five, uh, what's it called again? Factorial? It's like a five factorial, but you're missing the two. Yeah, you exactly. You probably do it divided by two. Yeah, divided, divided by, two, by factor. two factorial. You got it, exactly. So it's five factorial. This right here, the five times four times three, I'm actually gonna put a box around this so you know where it's coming from. I can actually rewrite that as five factorial divided by two factorial. And the reason you're allowed to do that is because um, when you divide by two factorial, it cancels out. It 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 will cancel out with the two times one, right? So that's thought that will be gone in the numerator. Exactly. Um, and then of course we still have the three factorial at the bottom. Just don't forget about that. So the three factorial there. Um, this ends up giving us this ends up giving us one big formula using just factorials that will tell us how to count how many groups that we make. So that might give you a little bit of a hint as to what the formula is. So I'll tell you what the formula is now, just general way to count this. So don't worry about writing that, we just already went over that. So in our last example, we saw that there are five factorial divided by two factorial divided by three factorial ways to do this. And again, doing a little bit of math here, or you can do this with the calculator, five factorial divided by two factorial divided by three factorial, that ends up giving you an answer of 10, right? So there's actually 10 different ways to do this instead of six. So it makes quite a big difference actually. Um, so here's the definition of what we're doing. So combinations are basically a collection of, oh, I have my pen here, and I have the wrong eraser. All right, uh, so combinations are a collection of our chosen objects, so let's if we're picking our objects, and again, that just represents some number that we, we're not, we don't know yet, some number of objects that we're picking from a group of n objects. And the most important thing in this case, it's, a, uh, it's basically a combination of objects that you pick from a group where the order does not matter. So the definition of the combination permutation, that's, this is where people get confused. They sound extremely, extremely similar, right? Um, if you look at the one we did yesterday, it's pretty much the, the same one. I'm pretty sure I almost copied this exact same definition because it will follow the same format. The one big difference here 
is that it actually does matter the order, uh, sorry, it doesn't matter the order that you put it in, right? Yesterday it did matter, today it doesn't. You're, so essentially the one difference here is that we're not making arrangements, we're actually making groups. That's the best way to say it. So the formula to calculate it is actually not that different from permutations. And Charlie just asked me today, what's that C and R on your calculator? What does that calculate? It calculates the number of groups you can make. And the formula, you're going to look at it here. It's actually very similar to the one we did yesterday. There's one little difference. I have to divide by R factor. And that kind of makes sense because that's what we did in that last example, right? We ended up dividing it by three factor. So it's just one tiny little change for that. So just checking your calculator stuff, and you can even try it right now. Um, for the last example that we just did, see if you can type in five choose three on your calculator, you should get 10. You should get the exact same answer. If you have that button. And if you don't have that button, then you're gonna have to uh, use the formula, right? And again, a reminder on your quiz, I'm just kind of warning you about this. On your quiz, I'm going to have some trickier questions, and I'm doing this on purpose because I know you guys have calculators and I know you can use that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not necessarily going to be looking for one final answer. It's going to be something where I give you an expression in terms of combinations or permutations, and I'm going to say match up this expression with the calculation that's shown. So you have to kind of find the correct format of that permutation or combination, right? Um, so that's when it gets a little bit harder. You have to actually think about how to write a uh, product in terms of a permutation or a combination, right? Or a factorial. So this is just repeating. You don't have to write this part because we already, we already mentioned this a couple of times. Remember combinations and permutations, why are they different? Because it's where people get confused. Combinations are essentially counting how many groups you can make. So when you're creating groups, think about real life, right? If you're making a team or if I'm making a group in a class, like let's say we're doing a, some classwork, we're obviously not doing it this year because of COVID. Um, but if we were doing classwork or some um, creating groups, the order doesn't normally matter, right? Uh, I usually just may say, okay, there's four people in one group. doesn't matter. You don't have to have like a spokesperson. You just have four people there. Right? So in this case, combinations would be helpful. Permutations would be helpful if I am trying to pick out um, maybe like maybe we're doing speeches or something or we're doing an assembly and we have to figure out the order that people are going to present, right? Like, so who's going to go first? Who's going to be the first, uh, the first show, right? So then I have to have that in a very specific order, right? So it does matter who gets picked first, who gets picked second or third. So again, the first time you see formulas, I find formulas always look really confusing. And I found the same thing for permutations. First time you learn it, it seems really intimidating, uh, but you're gonna notice it's not that different. So let's look at an actual concrete example with numbers. So one big difference, I have it here in the notes, but I just wanna make sure, because I feel like I actually forgot to verbally mention this. There's actually two ways that I can write combinations. I can write C and R, just like yesterday, kind of similar to that, except that it's C instead of P. But we have another, it uh, looks really odd way of writing it. Uh, we basically write one giant bracket, and the top number has the number of, the total number of objects. The bottom number has the number of objects that I'm picking, or I'm choosing in this case. And I'm just trying to emphasize the difference there. So, N at the top is the number of objects that I have, the total number of objects I have. R is the number of objects that I'm going to choose. So it's just a different notation we use here. And speaking of words, here's another thing, and I think Mr. Edwards and I were talking about this. Um, this isn't always like a standard thing, but generally speaking, um, when we, at least verbally when we say it, uh, if we're talking about permutations, we tend to use the word pick. So if I'm saying I'm picking something out of a group, 
I basically am talking about a permutation. Okay, and this is not just letting you know this isn't a universal thing. Um, because I know when you go to other classes, they may not even use this and they may not necessarily know the difference between it. But I'll try my best, I will sometimes fail, I'll try my best to differentiate it. So when I say pick, I'm actually talking about permutations, and when I say choose, I'm talking about combinations, right? I will sometimes forget, but I can warn you right now. But generally speaking, if I ever say pick, I'm I'm talking about I'm picking and I'm actually thinking about order, whereas choose is more kind of I'm just choosing a certain number of objects from a group and sorry from a from a collection, and I'm just creating groups. I don't actually care about the. All right, let's do this example together. So ten choose four. How would I write that out? So first, let's let's just write it out first, and I'll give you some time to just think about how to use this formula there. So, yeah, Ellie? So we can tell that n is 10 because it's on the top and it's four. So it might be easy to write that as c with n comma 4. Yep. And that way we can immediately just get that with our token with n. Um, on top and then down. Exactly. So the 10 is going to be in 10 factorial will be in the numerator and in the denominator you're going to have uh, 4 factorial, right? Because that's your R value and then 10 minus 4 factorial is going to be your other uh, is going to be the other number in your um, so it's going to simplify to give you this 10 factorial divided by 4 factorial times 10 minus 4 factorial and then this reduces to 10 factorial over 4 factorial uh, times 6 factorial and again once you get to this step you can definitely use a calculator I'm okay with that use a calculator if you need to simplify right so 10 factorial divided by 4 factorial divided by 6 factorial or if you don't have a calculator and the reason I warn you about this although I think this point is going to be moot um, when I went to university, the pretty sure the first and second year, no calculators allowed on the exam. So I remember that we had to, you had to learn the shortcuts for simplifying factorials because you would sometimes get some crazy factorials, right? And there is no way that you want to be multiplying numbers 10, 9, 10 times 9 times 8 times 10 plus 6 times 5 plus 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You don't want to do that. So the fast way to do this or a way to do this without a calculator, and again, I'll just show you these tricks if you ever need to use, if you ever stop on them. So what I would do is I would try to eliminate the largest number. So I can see here right away, that's six all the way down to one. When I'm multiplying six factorial here, it cancels out with six factorial. And now I'm actually left with something a lot easier. I'm left with 10 times nine times eight times seven divided by four times three times two times one. That's easier to work with. I don't know about you guys, but that's much smaller and easier to work with mentally than 10 all the way down to one, right? And how to multiply that. So if you can simplify the word, try to do that for yourself. Again, those are tricks that you use if you don't have a calculator. If you have a calculator, then of course you can you can use it. Uh, but even if you don't, even if you do have a calculator, sometimes you know it's just good to sharpen up your brain. Um, you know, you don't want to go dull. Make sure you're always practicing. But don't forget about mental math, right? I just think sometimes people just think, you know, have a calculator can do it all. It's good to practice, right? Just keep your brain sharp. So it ends up being 210. Everyone okay with that? With the bigger word problems, you're gonna see some of them that are like 52 factorial, or like, well, like that, that's that's just crazy. But like some of them end up being like 15, 17 factorial. Yeah, of course, use a calculator, but don't even, like, I really don't want to stress out with this paper and try to calculate it. Uh, I'm just talking more if it's pretty easy numbers and try to do it in your head if you can. Okay, here's another one. Uh, so you're creating a basketball team. Uh, there are 20 students that are trying out for the team, and you can only have 12 students on the team. So how many teams are possible? So how many teams can you make here?
So how do I know that this is a combination question, other than the fact that it's about, the whole lesson is about combination? Yeah, Rachel? If it doesn't matter the order that it's written, doesn't it just, oh, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. The order does not matter, right? If I'm making a team, uh, like I said, unless you're, I know some sometimes in sports you're, you're giving specific positions, but let's just assume you're just getting the 12 suits. It doesn't matter who I pick, right? Uh, since you're only picking 12, it doesn't matter the order I do it in. Uh, you're using combinations, right? So right away, I know I'm going to be using combinations. And I also know I have 20 total objects, and I'm picking 12. So I can just use the formula. So I'm going to be writing 20 factorial in the numerator divided by 12 factorial divided by 20 minus 12 factorial. Is this okay so far? Okay, and that will reduce to 20 factorial divided by 12 factorial divided by 8 factorial. Yeah, Rachel? So you would divide by 12 and then again by 8. You mean 20 factorial? Yes. Yeah. So yes, yes. You're going to divide 20 factorial by 12 factorial and then take that answer and divide by 8 factorial. Or you could, you could multiply and then take that answer and divide 20 factorial by that answer up to you, but I think the easiest thing is just exactly what we said first, 20 factorial divided by 12 factorial, and then di directly divided by 8 factorial. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the easiest thing to do. So if you do have the, comp uh, the choose button, you actually should be able to get the answer right away. Um, but again, if I ask you to show the work, please show the work, right? Um, so I'm going to be picky about that sometimes. Uh, there, there will be some times where I will ask you to, I'll, I'll make it clear, I'll say show your work, but I want you to show your work in general, how to find, you know, probability or how to find, uh, you know, if it's a, a more difficult question, then my focus really isn't on this. My focus is on you trying to understand how to count, right? Uh, so I'll kind of make it clear when you have to show the factorial, uh, you know, all the factorials behind how to say things, right? Uh, and then there's some times where I just want to do this. So what does this end up simplifying to? So even though it's a calculator question, guys, can I just know, I just want to make sure everyone does try it with the calculator. Just make sure you get the same answer. I just don't want you to also be making calculator mistakes as well, right? Because this is also common. So I'm showing you how to simplify it. Don't even worry about it. The end. Did everyone end up getting one hundred twenty-five thousand nine hundred seventy? Did anyone not get that? Okay. And everyone has a calculator that that can do this, right? Your phone. By the way, if you're using your phone, because um, again, we're doing some tests online. Uh, you know that your phone does. Uh, you can switch it into a scientific calculator if you twist it, right? So you have to, that. Does it have super function if I twist it? Uh, it does not have combinations. No, it does not. But it has factorials. Oh, the ex the little explanation. Yeah, it does. I so if you flip that. it, if you flip it, then you can see everything else. Oh. So you also have sine, cosine, tan, everything else there. It doesn't have the the shortcut for combinations or permutations, but you have factorials like this, right? And that will make your life easier because some you honestly, I'm telling you right now, you really need to make sure you have a calculator or a phone or something that can do that, uh, because some of the examples end up being like forty factorial, something like that. Um, uh, please don't do that to yourself. Even with a calculator, that's a pain, right? You're going to have to go 40 times thir 39 times 38 times, and then you're really going to have to know how to simplify it, and you're going to have to know how to do it fast. And then it's just going to make your test so much longer than it has to be, right? Um, and it's doable, but it's it's just going to take you a lot longer. All right, so here's another example. Uh, there are six boys and eight girls in a class. So... In how many ways can how many ways can the teacher choose a group if five students? Uh, sorry, have five students if there and then there's going to be a couple of parts to this question. The first part: if there are no restrictions, if there is one student, Charlie, who has to be chosen. If Charlie, we specifically don't want to pick Charlie. Sorry, 
And then the last one, if there must be three girls and two boys. So this question is a little bit, a little bit more complex. There's a couple more details to it. So let's just read it over carefully again, just to make sure we know everything that's important here. So we have six boys, eight girls in the class. So total, how many students do I have? I have 14 to pick from, right? I have 14 people. And we want to create a group of five, okay? That's our focus, create a group of five. So if we want to create a group of five, the first part of the question says there's no restrictions to this. So I just want to create a group of five. I don't care if there's they're all boys or they're all girls or if there's more boys and girls or any sort of combination. I just want to know how many ways I can create a group of five from the 14 students there. That's all I want to know at the first one. So, hey, one more at a time. Okay, I'll let you write the question first and then we'll, we'll go over the answer. So we'll do this one together. At the, fir the first one, I'll give you a little bit of time to do the first one at least. The other ones, um, especially the last one, is a little tricky. Um, so I'll, I'll go over the technique you used for that. So in the first one there, uh, we'll just double check that everyone got the exact same thing. We're going to take, uh, do you know that there's 14 students all together, is like, like Ali said, and it's going to be 14 factorial. But I'm just going to write out the formula here. 5 factorial over 14 minus 5 factorial. Uh, but again, now that you kind of learned a bit of a shortcut, especially with the calculator, you can definitely use that. So you're taking four fact 14 factorial divided by 5 factorial divided by 9 factorial. And that's just simplified to 2002. So there are 2002 ways to arrange that. Okay, the next one. Uh, what if Charlie has to be children? So what if he has to be included in the group? How did that change? How does that change my arrangement? Yeah, Matt? Maybe instead of group of five, it's group of four because one's dancing. Yes, exactly, right? So all it really does is it uh, it changes my, it changes the, the number of people I can pick, right? Because I already chose Charlie, then instead of having, so two things it changes. Instead of having 14 pick people to pick from or choose from, I only have 13 now because Charlie's already automatically included. So that changes the whole dynamic of it. So now instead of having uh, 13 people, 14 people to pick from, I actually only have 13 people to choose from. And I'm trying to my best to keep the words but forgetting. And of course, the number of people I can choose has now decreased because I, I, before I could choose five people, now I'm only choosing four people because Charlie automatically is in. So because Charlie's already in, it's, it's I have one less choice in terms of who I can, who I can choose from the group. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So that's why my number in this case changes. So instead of it being 14 choose five, it's now gonna be four, 13 choose four. So the total group I'm choosing from changes and the number of people I'm choosing also changes. Okay, what if I don't want Charlie in the group? What if it's the opposite? Yeah, Charlie? Um, then you have 13 people. Still five exactly. So then in this case, it's still going to be 13, right? Uh, and then it's going to be five students that you're going to be picking from. And again, the reason it goes down to 13 is because once again, kind of a, a similar, a, in a way similar to the last question, your Charlie is specifically being excluded from being chosen, right? So instead of 14 students, there's only 13 students to 
choose from. And we are still, but we're still choosing five seasons, right? So it ends up being 15, sorry, 13, choose five. And 13 choose five ends up giving you 1,287. So there's actually a different way to do this. And I just kind of mentioned this. I didn't actually write it down there. Um, and some of you actually might find this easier. If you know that there are 715 ways that I can choose Charlie to be in the group, if I want to find the number of ways I can't choose Charlie or I specifically won't choose Charlie, I actually know the total number, right? This is kind of like my sample space. This is the sample space size. What I can do is I can actually find the complement. So if I know the ways that I can pick Charlie, I can actually find the ways I don't pick Charlie by doing what? What can I do to find that? Yep. Exactly. All I can do here, I can actually make my life a little bit easier. If you didn't want to do all the work again, I can take 2002 minus 750. I just find the complement. So that's, you remember that trick? Remember we talked about compliments and I think the first day that we mentioned that people are like, well, why are we learning about this? Like, can't you just count it out? Sometimes it does make it a lot easier, especially if you're already given that information directly. Uh, it simplifies a lot of your work. And that would also, again, a little hint, it would be a good quiz question where I actually don't even tell you any of this information. All I tell you is there's this many ways to pick a team, this many ways to pick Charlie. How many ways are there to not pick Charlie? Right? That would be a good question because then you would look at this and be like, well, I can't figure it out because you don't even tell me anything else. But actually, you do know, right? All you have to do is find the copy. So find what's remaining. So there's another way that you could do it. I just want to show you that other option. And last one. If I am picking um, three girls and two boys, this is the one that is a little bit up. So in this case, it's almost like I have two different combination questions. Right. So because I'm subcategorizing it into choosing from a group of boys and choosing from a group of girls, it actually I have to kind of consider the combinations together. Right. So for the number for the number of girls, and I can put this here at the top. I know I have a total of eight girls. And it says here that I have to pick three girls. So of the eight girls, I have to think about how many ways I can choose three girls out of the eight girls I have there. We know we can find that by doing eight choose three. And for the boys, what do I do to find out how many ways I can choose the boys? So I have a total of six boys and I'm only picking, sorry, only choosing two of them. So it's gonna be six choose two. Now, just kind of like we did before when we talked about counting principles, if you know that there's this many ways to do first experiment and this many ways to do the second experiment, right? These are kind of like experiments, like picking from each of the groups. Then I know that if I want to find the total number of, of, of possibilities, all I have to do is multiply them together. So to find the total number of ways I can do this, I just multiply the two answers that I have. Does that kind of make sense? So I just kind of wrote it out here a little bit more formally. So six choose two for the boys, eight choose three for the girls, and then I just multiply the two possibilities. Is this making sense so far? So again, these are the examples that get a little bit trickier, but hopefully you kind of start to see that we're not really doing anything too different. You're just kind of subcategorizing. You're almost having little subcategories that you have, right? So you have two combinations, and then the only difference is that you're going to multiply the two answers together, right? To think of all the possibilities, right? Let me know if I can go to the next one, guys. Here's another example. So this is actually something called the indirect method. We'll talk about what I mean by that. 
There's actually two ways that you can do this. Uh, so first I'll show you the direct method, which is probably what you're more familiar with. And then I'll show you kind of the indirect method of doing this. So in how many ways can six people be selected from a group that consists of four adults and eight children if the group must contain at least two adults? This one's a little bit harder. I'm going to give you more time just to figure this one out because there's, I feel like it's not that simple. So remember, there's six people that you're picking, so you're choosing, but you're choosing from four adults and eight children. So the question is, in how many ways can you pick groups so you have at least two adults? So I'll let you guys just brainstorm a couple ways. I'll let you write the question first and then brainstorm a couple ways. How could you try to solve that? And for the recording, I'm just going to pause it a little bit. So. Many yep. combinations of adults you can have? Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, but it may not always be four adults, though, right? So There's how many combinations with two adults and four adults? Yeah, exactly. Now you you picked you kind of talked about the two cases. You talked about two adults, four adults, but it said at least at least two, right? So then we missed one case. Three adults. Three adults, right? So it's almost like you have to subcategorize this. Mm. So there's two ways to do this. So the first way is the most obvious one, which is what Charlie mentioned, is just say like, you know, we um, we count the number of ways that we have, can have two adults, three adults, and four adults. And then you're going to add them all up. Does that kind of make sense? So that's the most direct way to do this, is instead of, um, is since you want at least two adults, that means that we have to consider three cases, right? There's either two adults, there's either three adults or four adults, right? And the reason we stop at four adults, like Charlie said, is because we only have four adults, right? And I think that's what you were saying, is that like you, you're capped at four. So it's not like this goes on forever, right? You stop at four. So what we need to do in this case is simply count the number of ways that I can take two adults, I can pick uh, three adults, and I can pick four adults. So that way, there's nothing wrong with doing this, but I think that this will actually end up being a little bit more work. There might be something a little bit easier, although, again, the indirect way that I'm going to show you is going to look complicated the first time you see it, but there are going to be lots of cases, and you'll see some in the book, where, like I said, even in this case, it only went up to four adults. If this had gone all, all the way up to six adults, that means you would have to be counting the case of two, three, four, five, or six adults. That's five cases you have to add, right? That's just more work for yourself. So the indirect way says, instead of thinking about how many ways you have at least two adults, why don't you think about the opposite? So what's the opposite of at least two adults? The complement of that. Yeah? Four? Sir? Would it be four? Uh, no, the, the complement of at least two adults. So what would be like the opposite of at least oh. picking two adults? Yeah? No. One adult and? Zero. And? No? Nope. Zero. Zero adults, yeah. So the opposite would be one adult or no adults. Does that make sense? So you, if you say at least two, that means that we're looking at two, three, four, five, all the way up. But if we say, um, if we're looking at the complement, the opposite of that, it would be one adult and no adults, right? So the reason you want to do that is because then you can subtract that off from the total number of ways that I can pick all the people. Does that make sense? So I'm going to be subtracting that from the whole sample space. So the indirect way basically says that you can take the total number of ways that you can pick one adult and no adults, or no adults, and then you're going to be subtracting that from the total number of ways I can pick without restrictions. So whenever I say without restrictions, I mean I can, the number of ways I can choose people without worrying about if I have a certain number of, of either one, right? I'm just counting the total number of ways I can choose them. 
So again, in this example, it's not going to look like this is very helpful, but there's a lot of cases, and especially maybe not so much in this course, but when you take uh, stats probability later on, where you're going to be looking at some a really, really huge, uh, huge pieces of data, right? So it might be saying something like, what's the probability that at least one patient gets sick, right? Um, or at least two patients get sick. If you are looking at, at, at something that's at least of some number, that's really complicated because you have to consider the the number, let's say I say at least one patient gets sick. If you have a hundred patients, that means you have to consider a, the one patient gets sick, two patients get sick, three patients get sick, four patients get sick, all the way up to a hundred. That's gonna take you way too long. So then a faster way to do this is say the opposite. What's the probability that no one gets sick? That's the complete opposite, right? And then you subtract that from all the possible ways that you could think. Yeah, Joe? I still don't know how I count the number of ways. So I'm actually glad you said that. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So how do we count the total number of ways? And I apologize, I kind of started, I put it to the next one, but at least we'll talk about it together. So how do I count the total number of ways? Well, we're told right here that there are six people that I'm picking from, choosing. There are six people I'm choosing. And the total number of people that I have, I can find by adding the four adults and the eight kids. So that's 12 people. So that's how I, so I already know from the beginning that if I'm going to pick, if I'm going to create these groups and I don't actually care if I pick adults or if I pick children, then I am simply going to take the number of people I have to pick from or choose from, which is 12. And I'm going to choose the six people from them, right? That's with no restrictions. So I'm going to make a combination where I have 12 people to choose from and I'm making groups of six. Does that make sense? That's the no restriction, right? Doesn't matter who I pick. I'm just saying I just want to pick any six people. For all I know, they could be all six children. I actually don't know, right? It could all be six children. We just want to know how many ways can I can I create those groups. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah, but that, that's a lot of numbers. It still is. That's why I said this example is not the best. I'm not going to lie. This wasn't the best example. Because I realized that after I'm like, it still doesn't look that easy. Um, but if this if this question, instead of having four adults, it would have had six adults or seven adults. This I know this looks complicated, but the other way would have actually looked even worse, right? Because it would have had even more steps. Can so you walk me through why this all the numbers are there. Like yeah, the yeah, okay. Numbers? Yeah, we're gonna walk through. Yeah, of course. So what does this one represent here? This one represents the total number of ways with no restriction. So how many ways, so how many ways I can choose six people from 12, from the 12 altogether, right? And this is with no restrictions at all. So that means that I don't care if it's adults or kids. That's why I ended up adding two groups. Because in the no restriction one, I don't actually care if it's adults or kids. I just want, I just want six of those people. Doesn't matter who I pick, right? This this part right here, what this is representing, is the number of ways. The number of ways to choose no adults. So if you're picking no adults at all. And again, why do I write four choose zero? Because I'm basically saying there's four adults, but I'm actually not picking any of them. So four choose zero is just, yeah, you just leave it like that, right? That's what it's saying. It's like not picking any of the adults here. Yeah. You still have to write that, yeah, yeah. So, because I'm, I'm emphasizing, I know sometimes we talk about the zero not making a difference, but in this case, you still want to write it. This actually isn't zero. This is actually equal to one. This is the part that throws people off, right? Okay. Uh, because this would actually be 0 factorial divided by 4 minus 0 factorial. So I'll do the work up here. 4 factorial divided by 0 factorial divided by 4 factorial. This cancels out. And I don't know if you saw this in the note. I mentioned this yesterday in the video. Uh, what is 0 factorial equal to? Yeah. It's just 1. 0 factorial is 1. So even though, so Ellie's question, this is a good question. The reason I wanted to write that. Uh, two things, you're showing your work, but also 
if you people are you're almost in this habit in math that we're like oh zero you know sometimes you don't have to write it it actually is not equal to zero right so that's why you kind of emphasize that yeah why does zero factorize that? that's a good question uh, I'm not gonna get into the, all the details of it but if you actually think back to when we did um, even just a simple factorial like this four factorial divided by four factorial you know that that ends up giving you one. Uh, and then we can actually reason out that zero factorial, like if you don't have, uh, if, if you actually are not multiplying the numbers there, like it, it, you're essentially saying that there's no number that you're multiplying through, but you still have the actual one as your multiplicative identity, right? So if you don't actually multiply anything and you're, the, the basis that you're starting off that, it's, there's no numbers to multiply with, it would just be one in itself, right? Um, Good question. It is a good question. It's a bit. It's not an easy one to answer. Definitely not. Uh, but essentially, the the only thing you have to know here is that if you do see zero factor, it'll just be one in this case, because essentially you're saying um, that there's nothing being multiplied. But when you don't multiply anything, it's not it's not zero. You actually, it's actually called a multiplicative identity, which means that it's just one itself. Yeah. So it's sort of like you, there's one way of having nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's really what we're saying. Yeah, that's a great way to think of it, right? That we're just saying like, you know, just one. Does that make sense? So our next one over here, if we have one adult that we have to pick, then we know that, I'm just gonna write this over here, total number of ways to choose one adult. If I pick one adult, then I know that I can only have six kids. Does that kind of make sense? Because if I have six altogether, just doing a little bit of math, if I have six altogether, one of them is an adult, then that means that only five, that we would have five children. Okay? So that's where I'm getting these numbers from. And then once I know how I can pick out these groups, how I can choose the groups, all I'm gonna do is simply multiply, find out what each of them are, and then multiply together, and we're gonna be subtracting that off from the total number of ways I can create the groups. Does that make sense, guys? This question is a little harder. I'm not, I'm like, I know I know it's tough. I know that a couple of you have, I, can, I can't really see your full face, but I can just tell you might be a little confused. Um, so again, just ask if you're not sure, okay? This is where it starts getting a little bit odd. Yes, we will do more, yeah. There's there's a couple more, yeah. You want to calculate yeah. So if you're doing each one, so that's why I didn't I didn't want to go to the next part yet. So if you can just figure out what 12 choose 6 is, and you can definitely, at this point, because of how long it is, I mean, because it's longer than before, you can use a calculator, of course, right? Um, so it, on the test, basically, you use it as a rule of thumb. If it's, a, if it's something that's more complicated, you're going to see a lot more complicated questions like this. I on, you don't have to show me every little detail of like how you calculate the permutation or combination because the focus isn't on that. It's more about understanding the problem, right? Um, but if I ask you to show all your work for how you how you simplified it, then you have to show it, right? So after this example, after we complete it all, uh, let's take a quick little break guys and then um, we just have a couple more examples to go through after but if you don't mind I'll make the break really short just because I don't uh, want to finish the recording um, hopefully not too late so that we can um, so I can post it up for the class Rachel you have a question oh, oh sorry yeah. so let's go through the steps guys um, so what do we end up finding for 12 choose 6? You can use a calculator for that, that's fine. 12 choose 6. Did everyone get 924? Hopefully. And 4 choose 0, we said that that's, uh, that's 1. And then 8 choose 6, that should have given you 28. And then here, 4 choose 1 times 8 choose 5, that gives you 224. And that gives you a total of 672 ways to do it.
Does that make sense? Anyone confused by this? Or is that okay? Wait, so what was the second number? Which second number, sorry? The second, the, the... This one here? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the case that I picked no, no uh, adults. That's what I'm saying. So out of the four adults, I only pick, I pick no adults. Yeah, and then, how did you, how did you calculate it? Four choose zero. Yeah. Uh, that would be four factorial over divided by factorial? over zero factorial times four factorial. It's oh, this one up here. Cause, uh... Right, because it's going to be zero factorial at the, at the denominator, and then it's going to be four minus zero, which is four factorial. So it ends up just giving you one. Oh, so we can't pull out the one. Yeah. I think he's just confused that you didn't put over zero and over. So what do you mean, sir? Four over zero times four over six to get negative four six minus twenty eight, and four over one times two to five six all together. And he didn't do stuff like that. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, I think that's what you meant. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, Joe, I just did this whole step in one one go. So this was 4 choose 0, that's 1. 8 choose 6 is 28. And then 1 times 28 is 28. That's how I got that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I didn't show, like, every little... Separate, and then you multiply yeah, exactly, yeah. And yeah. Then yeah. do the same thing. Yeah. So others. if you so if you guys don't mind, I, I'm not, yeah, and I apologize for that. I'm not showing as many steps, and the reason for this, two things, is just, like, it just makes the PowerPoints a lot longer and then it has to it makes everything smaller. And I'm just kind of like in the in these questions, I'm hoping that the actual formula stuff is okay. You're I'm hoping you're okay with that. Now now the hard part is actually just understanding the problem. It's not even the formula, right? Now it's the problem that's actually getting tricky. That's why I'm just kind of focusing more on just setting it up, right? Because I'm assuming as long as you have a good calculator, you can figure out what, what each of these parts are, right? Okay with that? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just doing it. Like, make sure I get the right yeah. answer. Alright, guys, so we're going to take. Wait, what's this? Are we doing another thing now? No, same That's lesson. We're just finishing up a couple things. So this is new. Look. <laughs> it looks new, but it's we're still continuing on. Okay? So, a lot of stuff, guys. I apologize. Yeah, okay? There's a lot of stuff. So, uh, this, this right here, what we're going to talk about just as a bit of review actually from before is looking at how to calculate the probability of consecutive events. Okay. So all I need you to write for you now, just write the, this part right here, the two formulas. I know you already know them, but I kind of wanted to kind of put everything together because up to this point, this is where people get lost. They're like, we've been doing so many things right now that they're like, so what happened to conditional probability? What happened to three diagrams, right? <laughs> what happened to all those other things we've learned, right? They're not, they're not completely gone, right? Um, we're still kind of connected with that. So going back to Margaret's question about the tree diagrams, the tree diagrams are, there. that's not a bad idea. You can definitely still think of doing that. Um, my only suggestion for that though, is that you, because of the numbers and because of how large they become, you don't want to be doing a tree diagram if there's 26 different options or 30 different options. But what you can do is you almost want to think that you're, you're doing a tree diagram in your mind, right? Or you're thinking about how to actually recreate that, right? And you're trying to spot patterns. That's really what you're trying to do when we, that's what we're trying to do with, with the tree diagrams at the beginning is to try to see if there's any patterns and there's anything that we can extend so to make our, our counting job a little bit easier. So we talked about these two formulas before, but I'm just going over them again to make it really clear. Um, if you have two events or multiple events that happen back to back and they are dependent, we know that there is a formula that we can use for this. You take the probability of the event B happening, if A already happened, times the probability of A. That's for the dependent event. So if they rely on each other, you have to use the conditional probability uh, multiplication principle, right? But if they are independent, this is always the one that's a little bit easier. You don't even have to worry about probability of B given A. You just multiply the probability of B times the probability of A. So these things are still true. And the reason I brought this up, because you're probably thinking, how does this relate to the counting stuff? This relates to this because if you're in some of the problems, you can actually pick and choose which method you want to use. You can always go back to using these methods. These methods are not bad, but now you're actually going to have a, a couple more options now that you've learned about combinations and permutations. 
you can also just count the, all the possibilities that are that, that we have there. Does that kind of make sense? So we're going to do a couple examples. Um, the next example, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll do it together. We're going to solve it using uh, conditional probability. And then we're going to kind of compare that with what you are, um, what you just learned about today, right? A few combinations. Everyone okay with that? Just write the formula. That's the only thing I wanted to write. And again, you already have the formula, um, but it's probably good for you to just kind of compare them directly, right? So this one right here, again, is for dependent events. And this one is for independent events. So just a question, everyone remembers what independent and dependent events are? That's definitely going to be on the quiz. So some, did anyone say that? Can say that again? What Sorry. is a dependent event and an independent event? Just make sure you know the difference. Yeah, Ali? Um, two things that don't affect each other. So if you were to draw a card from a deck um, and then replace it and then draw another card, uh, that's independent because that's from the deck. But if you were to say not replace the card, that would be a dependent event because you no longer have a full deck of full pieces. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. You said it perfectly, right? So again, if you replace the card, then you know that the probability doesn't change, right? You're still going to have the same likelihood of having it. But if you don't replace it, it changes. That's a dependent event, right? Um, so definitely make sure you know what that means. That's one of those quiz questions. Uh, it'll be that'll be a good multiple choice or matching question. So I'll, I'll ask you, or I'll, I'll basically say, pick up the ones that are independent and the ones that are dependent or something like that. And then also the other thing on the quiz that you want, might want to review, uh, mutually exclusive versus not mutually exclusive. Does everyone remember what that means? What's, what is mutually exclusive? Um, oh, events. Oh, I can actually answer this one. Um, it's when, uh, it's, hold on, it's like the, it's, um, but I can't think, uh, no, I know this one, this one's easy. An example. Okay, so first, while you think of that, um, we have just have a, this next example we're going to try out. So we have three cards that are selected at random from a standard deck of 52 cards. So let's find the probability that you have all three that are face cards. And face cards, just a reminder, guys, if you forget, that's the king, queen, and jack. Okay. And there's four of each. So let's just do a little bit of math. Four times three is twelve. Right. So this this one hopefully I'm I'm not trying to trick you. This is actually something that you have done before. Um, you had a question like this similar to this on the test, right? It was one of those um, conditional probability questions. Yeah, Joe. That's the one where you go like twelve over fifty-two. Yep. Times eleven over fifty-one. Yeah. Times ten over fifty. Yep. You gave me the answer. There. Perfect. Nice. <laughs> There you go. So hopefully everyone remembers how to do this. So there's this is the first way to do it. You take 12 over 52, right? Because again, the first face card, you have 12 options, right? So that's your NA. There's 12 different options for the first event out of 52. Once you picked out that face card, I have one last option from the deck of cards. So I now have 51 options, right? So this 52 has dropped down to 51. And the 12 has now dropped down to 11. And then, of course, now that I picked out that, uh, that, uh, that other card, the second card there, I only have two more, I only have 10 options for the next draw out of a total of 50. Does that make sense? Anyone think of an example for mutually exclusive? This this is good practice for the quiz. I can't remember what it means. So mutually exclusive events, what that means is two events that have no intersection. They have no overlap. Yeah. So like that's what it is. Um, I don't know. Your um uh, I don't know, you were born in 1990 or you were born in 1980, right? Like different ages. So you can't be both ages, right? 
You go to one or the other, right? Um, or like you go to one school, you go to CCH, or you go to another school, right? As far as we know, like you can't be attending two different schools, right? Like assume there's no like virtual school, all that stuff. Like technically that could break the rule, but yes, that, that would be an example and something else that would be mutually exclusive, right? They, they're generally speaking, no overlap, right? But what's something that would have overlap? Like give me an example of sets that would overlap. Where you could have both. I'll give an example. So, oh, yeah. I feel like you're interested in sports, like you can like sport. There you go. Perfect. That's definitely not mutually exclusive, right? Because you can definitely like more than one sport, right? And you can overlap, right? Uh, it's not like because you like hockey, you don't like something else, right? You can like other things. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to try to simplify as much as we can. Um, so when you're simplifying this, um, and the first thing I would do, the 12 or 52, make it easy for yourself. Switch that into 3 over 13. And then see if there's anything else that you can try to simplify after that. The 10 over, five, uh, 10 over 50 definitely reduces that to 1 over 5. That automatically makes your numbers a lot smaller. That ends up giving you this right here. So 3 over 13, 11 over 51, and 1 over 5, which reduces to 33 over 13 times 51 times 5. And actually, what I did here, if you're wondering how I got that 65 there, 13 times 5. That's what I did there. So I just tried to simplify that a little bit. So don't forget, guys, in the on the test, um, this last the first test uh, the, was obviously a little bit easier. You didn't have to worry about too many crazy fractions. In this test, you're going to see a lot more, a lot bigger numbers. I'm going to tell you right now, um, and I'm going to be a little bit more picky about reducing the fraction. Okay, so I will actually say you won't get the full mark if you don't reduce it because especially some of these ones. Um, that's also what I wanted to learn as well. Is to try to reduce it as much as you can. Yeah, Joe. How do we figure out how good we did on the other test? Uh, I will tell you, uh, I'm going to post it uh, by today for sure. I think I just have a few more left, and then uh, I will probably post it this afternoon. So it'll be public for you. So you'll be able to log in and see what your attempt is. Do you, did, do you guys, uh, were you able to see how you did on the quiz, the, last, the first quiz? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you go back, and then you, you look through it, and it tells you what your score was. It's going to work the exact same way with this. You're going to go back to your, your quiz, and it's just going to be under quiz. You're going to click on it and see, like, view attempt. And then you click on view attempt, and then you can see how you did on each one. If if we only use one of our quiz attempts, is that fine? Do we have to use both? Oh, this one you only have one attempt. No, but the quiz, the first one. Yeah. I oh, no, no, you didn't have to use both. No, that's fine. Just one. That's fine. Like you could have done both or just one. We should get two attempts for all the time. No. So you no. Just have listen, listen. I, no, I, I no, no. Myself. Listen, it's because like. It's complicated, it's like tricky with that, uh, where you have to put all the numbers in and use the mathematical symbols online. I've never done it before. And if I mess up and I know what I'm doing, I don't think I should penalize, so I think I should get two. I'm going to be nice when I mark the first one. Like, I, I, think I, I think I was generally nice with the marking. It wasn't too bad. And, like, yeah, I'm mindful of, like, you know, tech issues. I know that that's a pain. Yeah. Uh, but I also don't, like, that would also be a pain for me as well to have to mark two separate tests. The online ones, the, the ones that are auto-graded, I don't mind necessarily making those two attempts because it's auto-graded, right? But this one would mean I would have to mark your test twice, oh, right, potentially. Yeah. So that's also more work for me too, right? So then it takes a little bit longer to get it back. I, don't, I just feel like just to be fair, this one. But the, the, the quiz I may make, I sometimes will make them do two attempts, okay? It just depends how easy I find it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, uh, speaking of the test, guys, um, it's just a couple of things. Um, conditional probability, the one thing I will tell you, uh, you definitely need to review that. Because uh, I think, so uh, this kind of example might be really good for a lot of you. Um, I actually feel like those are the questions that stump you the most. The Venn diagram stuff, um, I feel like some of you either got it perfectly or you kind of struggle with it. Um, but the other questions were actually okay. Like the theoretical stuff, like the experimental probability was fine. Uh, I would say the biggest thing you need to review is conditional probability. But again, I'll post the uh, I'll post the solutions and uh, and your marks by today for sure. Okay, so if it's not up by like this afternoon, it just depends how busy it is with study hall and everything. Uh, but if it's not too busy, I can probably get done before two, 
If not, it'll definitely get done by tonight, okay? So just check um, check under the quiz attempts, and then you should be able to see where your mark is. So the first way that I showed you was actually nothing new. We actually already did that, conditional probability. And I did that for a reason. I wanted to review that. Just wanted to make sure that you kind of feel familiar with it. The other way you can do this is actually using combinations. So you can actually count out all the possibilities. So in this case, we kind of break it down. So we know that uh, when we find the probability of an event, we first want to label what the event is. So let's call event A the event that I get three faces. What's the sample space? The sample space is all the possible outcomes, right? All the possibilities when I am picking out um, the cards here. So if I'm picking three cards out of 52, out of 52 cards, how many ways can I do? That's what they want to do. How many ways can I choose three cards out of 52? So the first one, an S, the number of ways I can pick out uh, three cards from 52 cards, I can easily find that using combinations. And again, why am I using combinations and not permutations? I just want to make sure you know that. Yep. Yeah, exactly, right? So the question didn't say, you know, you, I want to have... I, so for the face cards themselves, the, so this is where it gets tricky. The face cards themselves, we do actually care about the order. But when we're talking about the whole sample space, I just want three cards. Any three cards, right? And it didn't say, like, you know, I want it to be done in a specific way, just any three cards. So in this case, the order that I picked uh, the three cards does not matter. So I'm going to be using combinations. So this is why the set gets a little bit complicated. We're kind of mixing in a couple of different things here. So how do I find 52 choose 3? Well, I can easily do that by using combinations. I ended up showing the work here. Um, some, so kind of switch it around. Sometimes I showed the work, sometimes I didn't. Uh, so if I am doing 52, 52 choose 3, of course, you can use your calculator to figure that out. If you're not using your calculator, um, this one's actually pretty doable. Uh, because you have 52 factorial divided by 49 factorial, which means that 52 factorial is 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 and so on, all the way down to 1. So what happens here is the 49 factorial, so the numbers 41 and 49 and down, all cancel out with the 49 factorial down here. And that's how I'm left with 52, 51, and 50 divided by three factorial. So I'm just showing you how I was able to reduce that. If you're wondering how I went from here to here. So essentially what I did is I just, I end up when I canceled out the, when I divided by 49 factorial, it got rid of all the numbers 49 and down. And then I'm just left with 52, 51, 50. Make sense? And I divide by three factorial and that ends up giving me 22,100. By the way, I don't recommend that you do this all the time because it's not like a very efficient way to solve it, but you can always go back to basics. If you ever do get lost about permutations and combinations, draw it out, right? I think some of you are more visual and you like to kind of visualize the problem. Definitely visualize it and think to yourself, all right, if I have 53 cards and I'm picking from 52, right, I can write out all the possibilities. So the first card I pick, I have 52 to pick from. Then I have 51 to pick from. Then I have 50 to pick from. And again, the reason it's going down is because I am not replacing the cards. And then once you have done that, you then think to yourself, all right, I'm multiplying to find all the possibilities, but I have to divide by three factorial because as I already mentioned, once you have chosen your cards, I don't actually care the order that I, I put the three cards in. Does that make sense? And again, this is for the total sample space, right? So this is different from the event space. So now let's look at the event space. So this is just a sample space. For the event space, now we're looking at the number of ways that we can pick the three face cards from the 12 face cards. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering, for when we use like combinations uh, going around, is I'm sort of representing the sample space? Yeah, think about it that way. Yeah, exactly, right? 52 cards. Yeah, you got it. So for NA, we're going to be counting 
the number of ways that we can take the 12, the three face cards from the 12 face cards, right? So how many ways can we take the three face cards coming directly from the 12 face cards? And again, because we're picking out the three face cards where it's gonna be king, queen, and jack, right? We don't actually, we're not actually concerned about whether it's, you know, jack, queen, and, and jack, queen, and king, or queen, jack, and king. I'm forgetting the order I said it in. Doesn't matter, right? And that's why, once again, you're using combinations because you don't actually care the order that you pick those, the, the order of those three cards once you have chosen, right? So for this next part, we're saying of the 12 face cards, there's 12 possible face cards, we're only going to take three. Sorry, we're only going to choose three. I'm trying my best to pick the correct words here. So we're doing 12 choose three. Uh, 12 choose three. And 12 choose three is 12 factorial divided by three factorial divided by nine factorial, right? Using the formula. And then that ends up being 220. So what is the last thing I have to do? So I found my. I found the number of elements in my sample space. I know the number of elements in my uh, in my event space. So how do I find probability? By the way, remember the first time when we did N A, we did probability is N A over N S, and a lot of you are like, "Why is it so? Why are we doing this when it's so easy?" This is why, right? Because if you don't use that formula, like now, I think the formula now you're thinking, "Oh, it's probably handy," right? Because uh, before it was so easy that you really didn't need a formula, right? You guys, even before this course, you knew that the probability of rolling a three and a die was one out of six. I think everyone knew that, right? But now when you get to questions like this, you really do need to understand what is my event space? Like what, is, what do I mean by that, right? What am I talking about when I say that? And what is my sample space? You need to be comparing the two. That's really what we're doing. So how do I find my probability here? So there's 220 ways that I can pick a face card, three face card, three face cards, and there's 22,100 ways I can pick three cards, uh, any three cards from the total deck. So what do I do? I'm doing five today. I divide the number of outcomes in the event space divided by the number of outcomes in the sample space. And I'm done. Of course, this right here, you want to try to reduce as much as you can. So divide by 10, divide by 10. I'm just showing you step by step how I did it. And then once I got to 22 over uh, 2,210, I then divided by 2. And that ended up being 11 over 11, sorry, 11 over 1,105. Everyone okay so far? Does this kind of make sense or no? Anyone confused? I know it's a lot, guys. This is not an easy lesson. Like I, I was even telling Mr. Edwards, I'm like, I knew that fermentations combinations, it's it's a little out there, okay? Uh, it's just because it's very new. I think that's what it is, right? You've never really seen anything like this. So it's not even like you can make a connection between this to something we did before. It's pretty new. But you will get a little better, right? It's going to take practice. It's going to take some practice as all this. Okay, next part, guys. Okay, just two more examples, and I actually might skip the last one to be honest with you because I feel like you already had enough. Um, so let's look at this one here. So in a standard standard deck of cards, what's the probability that you randomly draw without replacing three aces and one king? So this one actually shouldn't be too bad. Uh, it's very similar to the other one. Um, 
you can do it, like I said, you can do it the way that we did it before. There's no problem with that. So you can still solve it the old fashioned way with conditional probability. Um, and it's without replacement. So it's definitely conditional probability. Or you could solve this um, the way that we just learned right now to think about combinations. So guys, I gave you the whiteboard markers, but I forgot to ask you, do you need the marker? Does everyone have a marker for it or no? Yes, like, yeah, yeah, you're, so you're going to have the three aces and the king, right? So you can still do it the same way that we talked about before, with using conditional probability, but I'm going to actually show you, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to show you how to do combinations. So again, I always start off, you don't have to label this. I like to do this just so I, for you guys so you know where I'm coming from. So my event space, what, what am I interested in? The event I'm interested in is getting three aces and one king. Right? So this is what I'm interested in. Three aces and the one king. Okay? And again, the order doesn't actually matter in this case. Um, then my sample space is all the possibilities, right? Um, I forgot to mention this yesterday. I, I corrected this question. I think I put a video about like a few months explaining it. There was the one question about the true or false questions and how many they said three correct and one wrong. I think a lot of people ask me about that. And then they said, how come there's, how come the probability is more than it seems? And the reason for that is because they said three questions are correct and one is wrong. And then in that, in that question, the order did matter, right? Because you actually care about which one is correct, which one is wrong. So you actually have to think about all the ways that you could have three correct and one wrong. And there were four different ways of rearranging. But in this case, because I'm just choosing three cards, and as long as it's three aces and one king, then that's that's fine. I'm just going to take it as it is, right? We don't have to worry about rearranging. So first, I'm going to find my sample space. My sample space, uh, the total number there is going to be 52 choose four. And why is it 52 choose four? Because there's 52 cards, and I am choosing four, right? And why is it four? I just want to make sure you understand why it's four. Yeah. Four aces. And yeah. Oh, okay. The three aces and the king yeah. is four cards altogether. So basically, I'm saying, what's the what? How many ways can I pick four cards? Any four cards. So the first part for the sample space, I don't actually care if it's king or ace or anything. I'm just saying any four cards. So fifty-two choose four. And again, I didn't show the word about how I got that because at this point, this question is hard enough. You don't need to do like extra work for me. I, it's hard enough, right? That's and if you can just get through this, I'll be happy. So for the N A, you are gonna take the number of ways that you can get the three aces, whatever it up there, and you're gonna multiply that by the number of ways that I can get the king. So it's kind of similar to the question that we did before with the with the boys. Remember the questions about like picking the boys and picking the girls? Kind of similar to that. So that's what we're actually aiming for. But in order for us to even get that in the first place, we have to subcategorize the 52 cards. So we have 52 cards, but we're interested in getting three aces and four kings. So we know that there's four aces and we know that there's four kings. So what we're saying is of the four aces, I want to pick three, three of them. And of the four kings, I want to pick one of them. 
So I'm going to write right here, choose three of them. And over here for the four kings, I'm going to choose one of them. So does this kind of ring a bell with this? Do you see the connection between this and the, remember that boy and girl question about like this many boys, this many girls, it's kind of similar to that. It's not that different from the boy girl question, except that instead of boys, it's aces. And instead of girls, you know, the, the kings or queens, whatever it may be, right? So we're just picking out from this specific type of cards. So what we're going to do in this case is multiply uh, the number of aces that I have, which is four. Uh, sorry, uh, take four, pick, uh, choose three. We're basically saying of uh, the four aces I have there, I'm going to choose three of them. And of the four kings that I have, I'm going to choose one of them. So I'm going to label this so you know where it's coming from. This is the ace, and this is the king. And again, four choose four, four choose uh, three is four. Four choose one is also four. So four times four is sixteen. Then you divide that total by sixteen again. Uh, the other way around. Sixteen divided by four. So you. Know, the, the big number, the two. Yeah, you're going to divide 16 by the NS. Yeah, the big number here. Is that what you meant? Or the other way? The, the 16 is on, on top or on the Yeah, bottom? 16 is at the top. NA, right? And then you the get total the 66,000? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I. So then we're going to find the probability, and we know the probability is NA over NS. So all I'm doing is taking 16. And I'm dividing by all the possibilities there. And I'm just going to write, fill this in in case you forgot it, where this is coming from. And A divided by NS. That's where I got that. I'm just taking the total number of outcomes that relate to my event, which is the event of getting three aces and one king. And I'm dividing by the total number of ways that I can pick four cards out of the 50. Yeah. Rachel? Yes, of course. How did I get an S? Well, in, initially in the question it said I'm picking three aces and one king. So I look at that and say, all right, well, okay, so I have three aces and one king. Well, that means I have four cards altogether. But in, in my sample space, I'm always thinking about how many ways can I get this if there's no restrictions. So like, remember that boy-girl basketball question or the team question? It was a total of 14, it's similar to that, right? It was a total of 14 students that I had there. Um, and I was picking, and I, in that question, they said, oh, you're only going to pick five students. So with no restrictions, what that means is I just want any four cards. So if I want any four cards, then I can pick directly from the 52 total. I don't have to subcategorize them. I'm saying of the whole 52 cards, I just want to choose any four of them. does not matter what type it is. This any four. So how many different ways can I do that? This many ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm trying to pick the last one. Pick oh, the 16 here? This right here? No, the previous one. Oh, oh, this right here? Um, I, I used the calculator. Okay. Yeah, so I did fit, uh, or, and if you don't, if, again, if you have the shortcut, you can do, um, you can use that button for the combinations. If you don't, you can always do 52 factorial over 4 factorial uh, times uh, 52 minus 4 factorial, right? You're just using the formula. And of course, that reduces to 52 factorial divided by 4 factorial divided by uh, 48 factorial. Make sense? Sorry? So there's one more example, right? There's one more example. I'm going to stop there, though, to be honest with you. The other one is is uh, not that it's harder. It's just that it's it's all about, believe it or not, guys, it actually could <laughs> be worse. I remember when I took this course, we, so uh, you guys obviously know about poker. Uh, poker has literally its own type of, like, probabilities. They have, like, a whole set of, I want to do one of them with you, uh, but they get they get really complicated, actually. Um, those I would say those are some of the harder questions because there's, Lots of different combinations you can have, and you think about the order that you're, and those are more complicated because on top of that, you have to think about the order that you get it in, right? So if you have like a royal flush, you want a very specific 
type of card, right? Uh, that gets more confusing. Um, so there is one last example on there. Um, what I'll do is I'll actually get you guys to read it yourself, and then we can definitely talk about that one tomorrow, right? We can discuss that last one. But I figured for now, I'll just take a break from it because I feel like you already got enough new things. I'll let you worry about the last example uh, on your own, okay? And then we can do it tomorrow morning. We can just discuss it, okay? That's a really hard one. I don't even know if I'll put that on the test, but it's just kind of those like really tricky ones where you have to think about even more combinations of problems. Everyone okay with this so far? Yes, I think maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right. I think it's, uh, so I'm going to stop the recording. Interesting.